Exodus chapter 3. All right, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I want to go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Now when the Lord saw that he had gone over to the over to look God called to him from within the bush Moses Moses here I am said Moses don't come any closer God said take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground then he said I am the God of your father the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob and at this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. By the way, milk and honey is just like a catch-all phrase for a land that is great for agriculture and livestock. Like it's, it's a brilliant land the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I, am, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, hang on a minute. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, well, what's his name? What am I going to tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. What you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. The word of the Lord. Let's grab a seat. When I was deconstructing my faith in my 20s and hated church and ran away for a good few years, one of the big challenges of my life and my faith and my curiosity was, I'm confused what it means to have a personal relationship with God. I've been in church all my life, I've seen God move, but also seen some strange stuff and some unhealthy stuff. And what I thought was God was not God, and it just got me confused. And I remember thinking, I just have no idea what this personal relationship with God actually looks like. I hear about it all the time growing up. But frankly, I'm actually gonna say I struggle with that phrase, personal relationship with God, because, well, I have a personal relationship with my friends, and that's a whole lot easier. I mean, I see them, I hear their voice, we have a chat, we hang out. That's a personal relationship. I have no idea that, because that's not what I've experienced with God. I don't see him, I don't hear an audible voice. And it confused me, and I did not know how to meet God and how to grow my relationship with him. Over the years, and particularly as we see in this passage, God has helped me with, ah, this is what it means to have a relationship with God. This is what it means. And that's what we see in this passage because in this passage we have a paradigm of Moses having a relationship with God, meeting him and growing in that relationship. In fact, Moses throughout the Bible is known, famous for having a really brilliant relationship with God. That's what he's known for. And Exodus chapter three becomes this paradigm that we see throughout scripture of this is what it means to have a relationship with God either to begin with or to grow in your relationship with God. And it begins with this remarkable truth that can't be taken for granted, that God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you and wants to have a loving friendship with you. I mean, we can often think of God as an impersonal force. We can think of God as a doctrines or philosophy, but that's not relational because God is not those things. He is a person. He's not human, which was helpful for me to kind of, okay, but he's relational. 
He's a relational person who wants a loving relationship with you. So much so that in Exodus, later on in chapter 33, we read that Moses would, would meet with God and speak to him face to face as a friend. God is a person who wants a relationship with you. Not so that he can come in and criticize or shame or judge, but that he can bring you home as a father with a child and be in relationship. I love the fact that uh, when Jesus, the incarnate God, comes and chooses a group of folks to be friends with and to hang out with for three years, one of them called John writes his own biography of Jesus. And I love it, but I kind of want to hit John at the same time when he did this. He, he's in, his gospel, in his own biography of Jesus, whenever he appears in his biography, he doesn't use his name. He uses the he doesn't say, and John and Jesus did this. He uses a nickname that he has coined for himself after hanging out with God for three years. And guess what his nickname was? The one whom Jesus loved. The one whom Jesus loved. <laughs> I, mean, imagine, I mean, imagine that. If you're here, you're reading John's biography. Oh, John, give me a break. But for John, that was hanging out with God for three years. My identity has shifted fundamentally that the truest thing about myself is I'm the one who Jesus loved. That's how much he felt. This is the power of God wanting a relationship with me. This is the strength of his love that my very identity has now shifted to, man, I'm, God loves me. In fact, you can now call me that. <laughs> Shut up, John. <laughs> God loves me too. God wants a relationship with you. So much so, as we see with Moses, God always takes the first step. I mean, we hear so often in our culture, man's search for God and on my spiritual journey, discovering who he is. And that's true, but it's God who initiates. It's God who takes the first step. When we see this with Moses, right? Moses is kind of 40 years after rebelling and he's in the wilderness and he's shepherding and he's a refugee and he's just getting on with his life. Nine to five job in the fields, go back, eat, watch some Netflix and go to bed, right? He's not interested in spiritual things. We don't have any record of him searching for God, but God so loves him that he breaks into his life. And that's what we have with all of us, whether you're a follower of Jesus now or you are a follower, whether you're not a follower or a follower, God is always taking the initiative with you. Come closer. And he does that through a fascinating thing called a burning bush. See, in God's honoring of your free will and not forcing you into relationship, he kind of is trying to woo you in relationship with him by throwing you a burning bush. See, burning bush, what was it for Moses? It was a bush that was on fire, which was not uncommon in the desert. So that wasn't strange. But it was a bush that was on fire and not being consumed. That is strange. I mean, Moses must have been looking at it for a while to realize it's not burning up. I mean, we actually don't know. Maybe he was like a couple of days of watching this bush go, it's still on fire. It wouldn't have intrigued him straight away. He was, God had caused a burning bush that wasn't being consumed. So something natural, but confusing. Something that was breaking his paradigm of reality. Something that was a compelling curiosity. Going, hang on. See, God wanted to get Moses' attention. To send out the invitation. But he loves us so much, he's not going to make it so obvious that we really have no choice in the matter. This is the loving free will that God has given to us. Is he initiates but it's not gonna overwhelm us. Now, in my life, I've had lots of burning bushes that God has interrupted my life to go, come on. A lot of curiosities, a lot of inexplicable things that I go, oh my gosh, I just, God's trying to get my attention. I remember, again, when I was off wandering in the spiritual desert, I remember thinking, oh man, I just I can't ignore that some of these Christian friends who was stuck with me, even at my worst moments. Man, these are not ordinary people. There's something about them which is annoyingly amazing. 
Like curious Christians often break into our lives and you may have one in your life that has gone, if it wasn't for them, I don't think, that, that was my burning bush. People aren't like that. People don't love their enemies like that. People don't give like that. What is it? For me, one of my burning bushes that kind of brought me into and back to God was intellectual curiosity, intellectual inexplicable things of, hang on a minute, People don't just rise from the dead, but the overwhelming evidence that is that Jesus did. That's, that's inexplicable. And it was a burning bush that brought me back. I remember thinking, hang on a minute, if we're all, I was raised in an atheistic culture, and it was like, hang on a minute, if we are just all random atoms, just the survival of the fittest, um, what is just, where did justice come from? Where does the moral universe come from? Where does love come from? if we're just a bunch of atoms randomly trying to survive and the fittest rule. It was a burning bush. I remember the, some burning bushes were also the troubles in my life. I got allowed troubles in my life which kind of rocked my world of, we can all be like, I don't know about you, but I grew up with an idealized version of myself that if I performed well, everything would go brilliantly, you know? Everything would go brilliantly. And it didn't take me long to realize that I'm not in control. That things can happen that I'm not in control of. That my life can go sideways, not because of my lack of performance, but of just what's happened to me. And then I realized, oh, I'm not as good as I thought. And it was confusing. Oh, my word, my foundation has disappeared. I was disturbed. It was God using that as a burning bush in my life to go, Maybe I can't. Maybe I shouldn't be in control. Maybe it's for you the inexplicable emptiness that we feel. Like we thought coming to LA and getting rich and famous or successful in our businesses or a great marriage and a great house, a great car, all these things that the world says, if you get these things, experience these things, know these people, then you'll be fulfilled and find meaning and be satisfied. But we all feel like that one author who famously said, you know, what would you say to an 18-year-old version of yourself? He said, I'd go back in time and say to myself at 18, when you finally get to the top of the mountain that you want to get to, you'll find there's nothing there. I mean, how depressing is that? <laughs> but maybe you're feeling that inexplicable emptiness of, I thought this would fulfill. See, so all of these things are God's way of trying to get your attention. He's not gonna force you. He's not gonna make it so obvious that you can't choose. But he is gonna send the invitation. And more than likely, it's gonna be a fire. Something that didn't go quite right. But the thing is, with the burning bush, it's one thing to go, oh, look, a burning bush. And wow, an inexplicable Christian. Or wow, circumstances that didn't fulfill. But we're so busy, we can go, ha, huh, interesting. Anyway, it's time to go home for dinner. <laughs> right? We are so busy that God is like throwing bushes everywhere and we can't wait to get back to our busy calendar and go, wow, that was funny and strange. Anyway, let's move on. See, busyness will stop us doing what Moses did, which is, huh, I'm gonna go check this out. It says Moses turned aside, that Hebrew word is very intentionally there, to Moses stopped doing what he was ordinarily doing and he turned aside. He got off the beaten track, went over to this bush and was like, I gotta check this out. God makes the first move. He is sovereign and he loves you. But you gotta make the second move. And that's why I said this morning, well done for coming to church, because for some of you, that's your second move. All right. For some of you, it's alpha. Okay, I'm gonna check this out. I'm gonna investigate. I remember I say to folks on alpha, look, come on alpha, it's just worth, just worth for a bit of season being intentional to check out what's going on. I say to people, look, if, let's suppose you live for 70 years. You're gonna spend 20 years, three months asleep. 10 years, five months watching TV, five years, nine months in some kind of transportation, seven years, six months eating and drinking, and you've got approximately 570,000 hours, so why not spend just 24 hours exploring if God really exists? Turn aside, just come. 
Now this paradigm is not just there for people who've never met God before. This is how God grows all of us forever in our relationship with him. He keeps sending burning bushes. That he goes, come on, I'm gonna highlight something and I want you to turn aside and meet me there. That he interrupts us. And maybe you're here today going, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's something else which is just there going, I think God, this, this is normal, but it's not normal. God, I think, is using this to draw me close. Even reading your Bible. I say the, the best tip I have for you is the Bible is God's word, but it's a book, right? It's a book. And when you're reading it, then sometimes it just feels like a book. But every now, every now and again, you'll read something and it becomes a burning bush. You, ooh, there's some heat on this. And then stop and go in and say, God, what are you saying to me? Turn aside, don't ignore the burning bushes. Go deeper. It could be getting into a community. It could be serving. It could be, hey, we need to go on a marriage course. Hey, I need to go to this. I need to go. We need to turn aside. Growth comes when you turn aside. And as Moses came near, he turned aside, and it says this fascinating thing. Moses came forward, and to see the questions he asked God, he said, God, who are you? In other words, Moses is trying to be curious about the real God. Like, I need to work out who you are. In other words, he was treating God with respect of, I'm not gonna put on you my definition of who you are, I wanna know who you are. See, this is the point of the question where he says, if I go to Pharaoh and Pharaoh and all the Israelites go, who is this God, what shall I tell them? The language there is not kind of emphasizing what's your name, but what are you like? Like, who are you? And God gives this incredibly frustrating answer of I am who I am. I was like, what? I am who I am. And I think partly he's saying that is saying, look, when you come to me to get to know me, I am who I am. My name is not, I am what you want. I am what I am. And the joy of relationship is always getting to know the other person, not in the way you want them to be, but who they really are. And yet our culture tells us that you can define God as you wish. And then we go, why do I not have a burning relationship with this person? Is because you're not actually growing a relationship with God, you're actually growing a relationship with an idealized version of yourself. Right? I mean, imagine, imagine um, me going up to you and going, hey mate, I really wanna be your friend. I really wanna get, to, ah, this is fantastic. I wanna be like, let's be buddies. And that guy goes, great, that's awesome. I go, okay. I really want to be friends. And the best way that's going to happen is, look, I'd really love you to be kind of a bit funny and really love you to be an ENTJ in the Myers-Briggs profile. I'd love you to be an Enneagram 7. I'd love you to have a bit of an accent from England. And I'd love you to kind of agree with everything I say and actually never tell me off, never call me out on anything. That would be amazing. We'll be best friends. <laughs> I think that person would go, dude, Feels like you're in love with yourself. You don't want to get to know me. You want to change me. See, we would feel massively disrespected if someone comes and says, will you please be the person I want you to be? And yet we, so many of us think we can do that with God. I think we, as Moses shows, let's give God the same respect that we want from other people. Not to change us but to get to know us. And this is a great thing. God is not a mystery in who he is. We can really get to know who he is. And he gave us this, that he, we can get to know him. And what we find as we get to know him is that he is fascinatingly, amazingly beautiful. He says to Moses later on, he goes, I'll tell you what I am. Because Moses says, what is this I am, I am stuff? And he says, look, I'll tell you. I am all of these qualities all the time. And these are my qualities. I'm gracious and compassionate. I'm slow to anger and rich in love. I can't wait to forgive people when they've messed up. This is who I am. Oh man, that sounds like, that sounds amazing. That's not me. 
And then when Jesus comes along, John says, no one has seen God, but in Christ, he has made God known. And when we read the biographies of Jesus, I don't know about you, but when I read the biographies of Jesus, I go, oh my gosh, if this is God, this is good news. He's amazing. God is not a mystery. God is not confusing. He has made himself known to us. And the growth in relationship is to go, I want to know you, even if that means you're not me. Even if that means you contradict me, which he will. Even if it means he calls you out, which he will, because he's going to do all those things in love because he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. Moses came to know the real God. And then you see their relationship growing in what I would say two directions. That relationship with God, when you meet with him, it always has two dynamics to it. Face to face and side by side. Face to face and side by side. Moses meets God face to face many times in a burning bush, up a mountain. It feels like they're having coffee together. It's like, wow, this is cool and we're having a good chat. But that actually doesn't breed the depth of relationship that God is after. See, face to face, I don't know about you, but if I have coffees forever with the same person and I only just have coffees with them, it's like we, we run out of things to say. Except, how's your day? What did you think of season two? <laughs> what, do you like the coffee, right? We run out of things to say. It doesn't go deep because God has made us to go deep in relationships, not just face to face, but side by side. In other words, as C.S. Lewis says, great friendships are when you both look at something and go, oh great, you too, let's do this. And at the end of this passage, we see God going great, we're in relationship. Now, okay, I got, I got a project. We're gonna go and rescue, I'm gonna go rescue Egypt out of Israel. No, wrong way around. I'm gonna re rescue Israel out of Egypt. And they say, I'm gonna do it. I hear their suffering. I hear their cries. I'm a loving God and I can't bear it with evil in the world. So I'm gonna go rescue them. And guess what, Moses? You're gonna come with me. Let's do this together. And guess what? The next face to face is not, how's your day, mate? Well, how was season two? The next face to face was, oh my gosh, God, did you see the Red Sea part? Did you see my stick turn to a snake? Did you see because they did life together. And so often in our walk with God, we just feel, and the evangelical world has, has so trained us that growing your relationship with God is just face to face. Quiet times, reading your Bible. I don't know about you, but I hear people all the time say, I kind of feel a bit stale in my walk with God. It's a bit dry. I go, Yes, because your relationship with God is purposeful. Like God created you in Genesis 1. He said, God, let's make man in our image. In our image simply means we have a job to do. We are representing God in this world. We are seeing his kingdom come, his will be done. Turning back darkness in the light of Jesus. Turning back injustice with his healing love and justice. See, this is what we're called to do. And our relationship is on fire when we're doing things with Jesus. Not only because we're doing those things, but we're utterly dependent on him as well. Like Moses is going, oh my word, I can't deliver the people out of Egypt. He goes, yeah, you can't, but I'm with you. And guess what? His prayer life suddenly became super real because he was utterly dependent upon God. Are you just face to face? Are you side by side? I remember I, it was hard for me to, to come and be a pastor because I loved my previous ministry, which was in business. It was being in the mission field of the corporate world. I loved it. I, that was my vocational ministry. I remember we would get together with friends in the first law firm and then the, then the business and we would pray, Lord, let your kingdom come and we'll be done. We are by far in the minority. There's only three of us in this law firm of like 500, but we're here on mission. We are here to stir things up for the kingdom of God. We are here to see vocational renewal and see law be part of the way that your kingdom come, your will be done. See, that got me on fire because our prayer life was suddenly, God, you're with us and we could look for burning bushes in the law firm. 
Look for what God's doing in the law firm. We would pray, Lord, help us bring people to Alpha. We would Lord, help us like, you know, grow the pro bono department. Oh, Lord, let us use the legal system for justice and mercy. We were on mission together. And that sparked our life with Christ. And when I went to this other business, it was the same thing, straight away on mission together. I remember walking in and I didn't know if there were any Christians there, but I was praying, Lord, you know, help me connect with people because this is the mission field. And I remember one day I was in a little cubicle and this, you may have heard this story before, but uh, this guy kind of tapped me on the shoulder. And I was there, there's about 400 people on this floor. It was huge, all from around Europe. And this guy tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, never seen him before. And, but I think he was from the German team, and I was in the British team. And um, he tapped me on the shoulder. And I said, hello? He, he just leant in and said, I hear you are one of us. <laughs> I go, uh, sorry, I don't know what you mean. He said, I hear you are one of us. I said, I'm so sorry, I don't know what you mean. And he said, uh, you worship the king, yeah? <laughs> and I go, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I worship. And then he says, we are not alone. <laughs> I go, really? And he said, look. And we both put our head up above the kind of the, the little cubicle. And I saw this other little head pop up. His name was Siegbert. That guy over there was called Justin, who's still a great friend. And we were side by side with God going into that workplace, going, Lord, let your kingdom come. We met for prayer at lunchtime. We gathered a little Christian group that were there to love, love our workplace and love our consumers and see double digit growth for the sake of flourishing of humanity, not just helping our shareholders. Side by side, getting up off the couch. And then when you get back into the Bible, when you get back into prayer, when you get back into Sundays, the face by face, you're alive. Go to the side by side. And finally, we can only get close to God through Jesus. We can only get close to him through Jesus. Now you're probably thinking, well, this is a bit tangent, I don't see Jesus here. Moses got close to him without Jesus, or did he? We've got this really fascinating contradiction here. On the one hand, God is going, burning bush, I wanna to get to know you. Moses, come close. And then as soon as Moses starts to come close, he goes, oh, stop! Don't come any closer. It's like Moses is going, what's going on? Do you want me as a friend or do you not want me as a friend? Come closer. Oh, stop. And we get into this incredible dilemma of God throughout all of the Old Testament. Is how does his heart of love and affection and bringing people home, how can he do that at the same time as be faithful to himself as to bring justice to the brokenness of this world that we have all caused? How does God at the same time be loving and holy? In other words, how does God bring us close without us being consumed in the fire? You know, I mean, you think this is harsh, but hang on a minute, can't, can't God just like go, ah, it doesn't matter? But a judge is not loving if he just lets people go. A police officer is not loving if he just overlooks the crime. There's this dilemma that God has of Moses, don't come close because if you come closer, you're coming into my world where there is, I'm a judge. I'm not gonna sweep injustice under the carpet. I'm not gonna turn a blind eye to the evils in this world. And Moses, you may not think it. He probably does deep down, like we all do. We may not think that this world is bad because of us. But in our self-aware moments, we know. I may not do that, but I do all of this. See, sin is simply the Bible's definition of the stuff that humanity does 
to keep messing up the world. So how do we get close without being consumed in the bush? And this is the point, this is the fascinating, the beautiful thing of God. Because do you see in the text, do you see back in verse two, we're gonna have verse two on the screen here. It's, we see there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that the bush was not on fire, it did not burn up. But who's in the bush? The angel of the Lord. Hang, hang on, but Yahweh's in the bush. I am is in the bush. Yes, but there is this, the angel of the Lord is called the Malik Yahweh, which is this figure very rarely seen in the Old Testament. But each time this angel, which is just the word for messenger, kind of speaks the things of God in such a way that the people are going, this is Yahweh but it's also a person. Yahweh in bodily form, who's not being burned in the bush, but is so holy, he's right in the heart of his father. See, most scholars look at this and go, hang on, is this Jesus? Is this the pre-incarnate Jesus? Some go yes, some say maybe not, either way, what we're seeing here is God personifying himself to, to give us a taste of we need a mediator. That there's one day gonna come a man who connects us to Yahweh, who mediates his voice to us and then bridges the gap so that we can come close. See, God came in Jesus to actually deal with the punishment we deserve, the judgment we deserve, the justice that we all have. That God loves you so much, he's not gonna ask you to pay for what you've done, he's gonna pay for it himself. And he comes in the person of Jesus. He humbles himself to flesh, to die on the cross, to die the death that we deserve, that we might receive his righteousness that we don't. So that now when we see a burning bush, now when we see God calling us from within the fire, he no longer has to say, don't come any closer. But says, look, because of my son, come right in. Receive the fire of my Holy Spirit because now because of his righteousness, you're in the bush and you won't be consumed. Many people go, why do I need Jesus? Well, can't I have a relationship with God without him? It's like, you can see the burning bush. You can see the beauty of his voice in all of creation, but you're not at home with him because you can't without a mediator, without someone to take your sin onto himself that you can run on in and be at home because he's paid the price on your behalf. So what is your burning bush? He's given you them. Could be I need to respond, I'm gonna to go to Alpha, or it could just simply be, okay, I'm gonna to respond to what Jesus is doing in my life. But God is always drawing us in. And we're gonna worship now the one who made it possible. Because God loves you so much, he died that you can come all the way in. Let's stand together. Love you to close your eyes and just talk with Jesus for a minute, whatever's going on. What's been the burning bush in this sermon? Maybe there's just one thing, the rest of it was blah, but one thing you go, oh, that's got heat on it. I think God's saying that to me. Maybe you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna come to Alpha and check it out like Moses did. Or maybe it's something else for you. Maybe it's, I need Jesus. Because I sense God calling me, but I need Jesus to cleanse me that I can come all the way in and be forgiven. I'd love you to, during the worship, our prayer team, come on forward and we'll pray for you and you'll meet Jesus and you'll be part of the family of God or something else, our prayer team are gonna be here, just come forward, but let's worship the God who reaches out to us and draws us in and through Jesus, we can come all the way in 
and join him in the fire. Let's worship together.